Right now we are joined by John Grant, who's running for City Council Position 8, so uh, go ahead with a two-minute introduction. Great, thank you. Well, thank you very much for your time. Again, my name is John Grant. I'm running uh, for Citywide Position 8. I'm the former Executive Director of the Attendance Union of Washington State, which is an organization based here in Seattle. Uh, the focus of that organization has been on housing advocacy, and for the last um, 10 years I've been working and organizing in Seattle uh, for progressive causes. Um, one of the proudest accomplishments that I've worked on uh, was the Healthy Homes Rental Inspection Ordinance, which is a law that will that is going to affect this year, actually, to register all uh, rental properties and make sure that they meet basic health and safety uh, codes. So many times I would hear from uh, low-income folks who are living in uh, substandard properties, and their kids were sick from black mold, there was, you know, broken pipes that had exposed wiring. Well, I actually set out to do something about that. And in my time at the Tenants Union, we led a major campaign working with council, uh, council member Nick Licata to actually improve rental conditions across the city. We uh, negotiated with the rental industry and mobilized the community for this incredible win. Um, that is just one example of many other um, pieces of legislation that I've worked on at the local, state, and federal level. The reason that I am running for city council is that I think that we have this enormous opportunity to establish a progressive majority on the city council. And I think uh, with, with that opportunity, we can just do so much more. You know, we raise the minimum wage. Let's start doing something about, <coughs> let's start doing something about the criminal justice system. Let's start doing something about um, pay equity. Let's, there's so much opportunity right now. And uh, with council member Nick Licata stepping down, Who's going to be that progressive voice on council? That's why I decided to run. And uh, sorry, I thought red meant stop. So I'll just, <laughs> <laughs> but I'll just take my ten seconds to say that um, you know my my experience is working with the community to mobilize uh, buy-in so that we can actually get good things done for Seattle and actually have progressive change that is lasting. Great, thank you. Uh, so now we'll go to our uh, prepared questions. Um, these are two-minute answers, and you may turn over the sheet in front of you. If you'd like to read along, please leave it here when you leave, though. And John, will you start with the first question? I will. Seattle is experiencing a housing affordability crisis. Several policy responses have been suggested, including linkage fees, incentive zoning, subsidized housing, and rent control, among others. What is your approach to keep Seattle affordable? So it's um, all the above. Um, the, the housing crisis that we're facing, um, a lot of people will tell you, the answer is we need to have more subsidized housing or we need to increase supply. What I would say to you is that that candidate is selling you snake oil. We cannot simply build our, our way out of this problem. We need to pursue all of these problems, both rent stabilization, increasing subsidized housing and linkage fees, but what we have not seen is leadership from the current city council, and in particular, Council President uh, Burgess, in getting the private sector to pay more into affordable housing. Look at, look at South Lake Union. That was one of the biggest up zones that we've seen in recent history. It was a once in a generation opportunity to actually bring in resources from the private sector to build affordable housing. And the city paid for a consultant to uh, tell the city how much could they charge developers per square foot? And the study somewhere but said somewhere between $85 to $100. We ended up with a $22 per square foot fee that we left millions of dollars on the table. And that was Council President Burgess's proposal at the time. I'm talking to tenants day in and day out where if the city had the resources, we could actually purchase buildings and take them off the market and maintain them, them as affordable. If we continue just to not the, uh, require the private sector to require greater linkage fees, greater incentive zoning, mandatory inclusionary zoning, we were going to lose building after building affordable housing. If I was elected as a council member, I would pursue linkage fees, mandatory inclusionary zoning, rent stabilization. These are all important policies to get us to be a more affordable place to live. And right now, we don't have the leadership on council to make it happen. I would bring that leadership. I've been an advocate for housing for over 10 years. And I actually worked with a group of other advocates to put together a 15-page proposal itemizing many of these uh, solutions and how we would actually implement them. Great, thank you. Uh, Renee, number two. Last year, voters approved a levy to fund our universal preschool pilot program. 
After the pilot concludes, how would you fund the full implementation of the program and what policy changes would you make to assure this plan addresses educational disparities in our city? So I think one of the um, biggest problems, after we, we raised the minimum wage, it didn't solve all of our uh, economic inequality issues. And I think this is something that in particular, when we look at how, um, you know, Seattle is number one in the nation in terms of gender pay disparity, that is, that is a deplorable position to be in. And I think that if we were to um, assess the uh, universal preschool pilot and make sure that it was working properly, that we should think about expanding it to truly make it universal. It's not truly universal, it only uh, subsidizes 2,000 students in our city. I think that if it does demonstrate that it's effective, that we should, <coughs> that we should actually expand the proposal and we shouldn't do it um, at the cost of workers, that we should make sure that uh, educators are also paid a living wage, which unfortunately was, um, you know, that, that was, we kind of lost an opportunity because those two initiatives were pitted against each other. Um, I would see, uh, I would want to see universal preschool increase so that uh, that is could be a fundamental tool to addressing gender, uh, the gender wage disparity that we're seeing in Seattle because it's an issue that predominantly affects uh, women. So I, I think I uh, would like to see it expanded, but actually expand so that it is actually universal and we are actually uh, addressing that, that gender wage gap as well. Great, David, number three. Can I, oh, you, you skip, skip. sure. Yeah. Bertha is still stuck. What options does the city of Seattle have with respect to potential cost overruns, the waterfront of transit, and an unsafe viaduct? So uh, the city did a study to determine whether or not the viaduct is actually going to be safe or not. I think that um, the city, you know, this, it's, a, it's a state project, but the city has options on the table to make sure that public safety is being upheld. I am really concerned about the structural weaknesses that are being found in the buildings in the surrounding area and also in the viaduct itself. And if it got to the point that the viaduct could potentially collapse, and we had an assessment that told us that, I think we should look at having a municipal uh, decision to actually close down roads that lead onto the viaduct and do whatever we can locally to make sure that the public safety is being secured. Um, as far as alternatives, I think that if it gets to the point that this <coughs> cannot be, um, you know, res if resurrected and actually, you know, complete the, the process, then we need to look at other options like the surface street solutions that uh, was being considered by, by voters prior to Bertha being kind of the uh, decision that was forced on, on the city. I think the tunnel um, was a mistake. I think that there were other options on the table that could have been uh, less expensive, uh, but unfortunately uh, we need new leadership to kind of get us out of this problem that, that was created uh, by the, the existing leadership. So I think that uh, looking at surface street options, um, I think that uh, if it is in fact the case that the viaduct could potentially collapse, that we take local action if the state's not going to uh, address the issue, and that's how I would approach it. Uh, Michael, number four. Seattle is the fastest growing big city in the country. Should we encourage or discourage this growth, and what policy changes are necessary to accommodate the growth? So I do think that it's a good thing that Seattle is growing, but there are growing pains that we're experiencing. And it's manifested in many different ways. Uh, one is a strain on our transit system, but another one that I think is most visible is a strain <coughs> on our affordable housing stock. Right now, the, the jobs that are being created in Seattle tend to be um, you know, high paid tech sector jobs. And so we have folks moving into the city and developers are trying to build to that market. So that's why we're seeing premium rents when new, build, new construction is coming online. So the question is, what can we do to recapture the value of the land as the value increases when that development happens and then redirect it to folks at you know, zero to 30 to 30 to 60 of the area median income. And that's like you know, baristas, secretaries, teachers, folks in that, in that kind of level. And um, right now, that's not what we're seeing. If we just let the market just build, we're gonna see high cost housing and that just doesn't work for working class people. Um, I think that linkage fees is one way to address that. I think expanding the light rail and, and um, expanding uh, transit, especially the uh, fully funding the bicycle master plan, are ways to create a more dense city that is also more affordable. And I think these are all tools that are available to us, but we need leadership at city council to actually make it happen. 
Great. So now we'll open it up to follow-up questions. These are one minute. <coughs> uh, people can ask whatever they want. I have one, then Joseph. Uh, so I like to ask this of all challengers. So you're running against an incumbent. Of course, no one has is entitled to any seat. But uh, you've alluded to this already, but is there a particular reason why Tim Burgess should no longer be on the council? So there are two at-large seats, two citywide seats that represent the interests of all Seattle. And Seattle is a very progressive city. I think that if we're only going to have two seats to represent the city, it should go to a progressive candidate. I do not think Council President Tim Burgess is that candidate. Um, he led the effort to pass the anti-panhandling ordinance that was eventually vetoed because the Seattle Human Rights Commission found it to violate human rights standards. <laughs> uh, I already alluded to uh, the lost opportunity at South Lake Union where there was this upzone and Council President Burgess, who accepts contributions from developers, <coughs> And it's not a coincidence that he uh, required a very low fee that was a lost opportunity for affordable housing funds. Um, I've taken a pledge not to accept any contributions from corporations or private developers, so voters know that I stand with them. That's, uh, and let's not even talk about you know, police accountability. He was the chair of the public safety uh, com uh, committee, and for four years, what happened? We had the uh, Department of Justice come down, and now we've got a consent decree. We can do better than this. Joseph? Can you give us an example of uh, some time that you've changed your mind on a policy issue based on data? Um, yeah, that's a good question. So I, you know, I used to be a very, um, I used to question whether or not we should actually increase mother-in-law units in uh, backyards. It's a, you know, it was sold by developers as, well, this is a way to increase density and create affordable housing. And I was kind of skeptical. But then they kind of pointed to Vancouver, and they're like, wow, you know, actually there's quite a bit of affordable housing that, that's provided in mother-in-law units because they changed some of their zoning requirements. And I used to be kind of on the fence about it, but I'm more convinced now based on some of that data that, you know, ex kind of expanding the zoning uh, requirements to allow mother-in-law units could be a way to increase density and allow greater affordability. John? So you said you weren't going to be taking any, any contributions from developers. On a citywide race, how do you plan to win? So I think that there are many examples of grassroots candidates who have led efforts successfully to defeat an incumbent. Um, Judy Castro ran uh, in the 90s. Uh, on a similar platform as me and uh, defeated an incumbent. I am running a grassroots campaign. I'm going to be opening an office space and have uh, volunteers calling uh, voters. I'm hoping to you know, hit over 100,000 voters. And we're talking about $50, $100 contributions. And all that adds up. I'm not going to raise as much money as my opponent. He's going to raise you know, $250,000, $300,000. But I am going to raise enough to reach um, a, uh, the, the Seattle electorate and actually get my message across. And I think it's not, it's not about money anymore, right? It's about what is, what is the message and what are our values as a city? And I think that can cut through a lot of the static that money can buy. Uh, Joseph? Um, can you give us what your first bill that you would introduce would be and how you would get it passed? So one of the first things that I would like to see done is a program to create a municipal bond to vastly expand the affordable housing that's currently provided. Um, actually, the city of Olympia just did this recently. The city of Seattle doesn't have a program to kind of front the money and then pay it back either with rental revenues or with uh, fundings from linkage fees or other sources. Um, so as a result, when tenants are being displaced from the city, you know, just around the corner, right, from the lock haven, the city could have bought that building. You know, they could have saved everyone's home, but the city constantly says, well, we just don't have the money to do that. A municipal bond could create the finance, the funding stream to actually preserve buildings like the Lock Haven and prevent people from being displaced. That'd be one of the first things that I would like to see done, and I think that there's already interest amongst the council to do it. Another thing that I would like to see done, like in the first, you know, e easily in the first year of my um, term, would be to pass a law to reduce moving costs for renters. People are paying like $3,000 just to move into an apartment, and many folks are deciding not to live here because they can't even afford the deposit first month's rent and the, and the last month's rent. What's, what's the harm if we break that into, uh, out into a payment plan so that you can pay for it over time, rather than all up front? Yeah, Evan? <coughs> Excuse me. 
Excuse me. The uh, council briefing recently included a description by Councilmember Sally Bagshaw about an event that took place the night before that was a housing town hall hosted by Councilmember Sawant and uh, Councilmember Lakata. It is, there's a Seattle Times article recently that describes uh, how she may have broken ethics violate, you know, violations by having her campaign very present at City Hall and requesting signatures for folks to join the campaign in the amongst the other group. Sure. I'm just wondering if you could share what your opinion about the allegations or about the event that took place and how you would have done something similar or different. Well, I'm, I'm not currently a council member, so um, I actually was attending that rally and spoke at it. Um, I contacted the Seattle Ethics uh, and Elections Committee or Commission and I asked them, is there a conflict for candidates to show up and actually have campaign materials and so on and so forth? And what I was told by them is that it's a First, Amend it's a First Amendment issue. Uh, and as long as you follow the, the protocols set out by the uh, Sawant campaign, and so that everyone has equal access to actually present their materials, then that can be acceptable. So when I, I contacted the SEC, because I was worried about the same thing that you were worried about, is this an, an actual ethics violation? And what I, what I was told is that no, as long as you follow the, the protocols and everyone is free to come and, and no one uh, candidate is being privileged, then no, it's not. I think with Councilmember Sawan, it's not on her to get other candidates to show up to the event, you know what I mean? That was kind of on them to show up. Thank you. Mary? Um, what do you think about the city providing broadband as Tacoma has done? I'm a big supporter. I'm sorry? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, I'm a big supporter of municipal broadband. Um, I would want to know more and do more research about how we would fund it because it is very, it's a very expensive to take that on. And we're talking about renewing the Seattle housing levy next year. We're talking about the uh, mayor's you know, $900 million uh, you know, move Seattle levy that we're talking about. And I would want to make sure that we're balancing all of our funding priorities and have that conversation as a community. Um, so I have a question. You actually sort of beat me to it. I, we can see Lock Haven out this window right back here. Mm. Um, and I was wondering if you could just sort of talk about what has gone on there and what policies, you know, if you'd been in the council four years ago, eight years ago, what could you have done that would have made things better over there? Um, well, the Lock Haven, you know, so that was 100 units or over 100 units of working class uh, housing. You know, it was not subsidized. It was just affordable. Um, a developer, Goodman Real Estate, swooped in, bought it, and then doubled people's rents. Um, and actually, uh, you know, gave folks illegal eviction notices. Um, in my time at the Tenants Union, we thought that that was wrong. We worked and organized with the tenants and actually got those illegal eviction notices rescinded. Um, we were able to get tenants um, tens of thousands of dollars in relocation assistance. And we asked Goodman Real Estate uh, and John Goodman, the owner, who lives just down, you know, two miles from here, uh, can you at least set aside some units to be affordable? He wasn't willing to do that. What I would have done if I had been council member eight years ago is that I would have allocated resources so that we had an emergency fund so that when buildings like this are being uh, bought and sold and folks are being economically evic evicted, that the city would take it off the market, have the owner be compensated, but then maintain the rents as affordable. And I should note that John Goodman, who bought and displaced the folks in that building, makes polit political contributions to Tim Burgess. Got time for about one more question, if anybody has one. Anybody? Hi. Yeah, Mike Joseph. So you already mentioned Councilmember Lakata. Can you tell us which other council member you most respect on the council and why? I really respect uh, Mike O'Brien. I've worked with him uh, for a number of years now and worked on land use issues, tenants' rights issues. Um, I think he's very thoughtful. I think that he's a strong progressive. Uh, and I think that, you know, part of the reason that I'm running is that he needs support. You know, I can't just be, uh, you know, the three progressives on council. We need to get to a progressive majority and have five, five votes if we're going to actually move progressive policy. Right. So we're about out of time. If you want to take 30 seconds for a closing statement. So a lot of folks have asked me, you know, why did you decide to run, run against him? And, you know, I, I think that it's important for folks to know that, you know, I liked him. You know, he's a nice guy. And what I would say to folks is, you know, and what I hear from people is, you know, I, I respect him, but I often disagree with him. 
What I would say to you is that for your council member, wouldn't it be nice to both respect him and also agree with him? I'm running as a progressive Democrat. I'm running on uh, affordable housing, on police accountability, on campaign finance reform. I'm going to be having a grassroots campaign that is going to go uh, throughout the city to, to build support, and I'm asking for your support as well. I think we can do a lot together, and I ask for your, your vote. Thank you. Thank you very much.